Hi everyone. As private companies like OpenAI and Anthropic develop increasingly advanced artificial intelligence, governments of global powers are paying close attention. With the significant military potential of AI, this technological race could dramatically escalate geopolitical tensions. Will this competition for artificial general intelligence, or AGI, spark a new Cold War? What would the ramifications be of such a conflict? Keep watching to learn more. This video has three parts, militarization, the San Francisco project, and the doomsday argument. Part one, militarization. Artificial general intelligence is basically AI that's as smart as a human. Creating AGI is the stated goal of many research organizations, including OpenAI. Depending on who you believe, we're either on an exponential curve of AI development leading towards AGI, or potentially a bit of a sigmoid curve, which means things might slow down. As a result, AGI could come as soon as this year, or a handful of years out, or in my opinion, with lower probability, it could take longer than that. But more on that in another video. In this video, I'm going to talk about a recent publication by Leopold Aschenbrenner, who recently left the OpenAI super alignment team. This was the team responsible for figuring out how we might control super intelligence in the future if we were to create it. I made another video about how OpenAI's super alignment team dissolved, so if you'd like to learn more about that, check this out over here. Anyway, Leopold Aschenbrenner, who I'm just going to refer to as Leopold throughout this video, created a really long multi-part essay which he called Situational Awareness, and the URL is situational-awareness.ai. You can see a link in the description below. But be warned that it's basically a book, it's like 150 pages or something like that. The essay highlights the rapid speed at which AGI is approaching due to the rapid scale up in size in terms of training data, training clusters, parameters, and all that. And according to the fairly simplistic modeling in that essay, AGI would probably arrive around 2027 or 2028. The essay also highlights the high level of state intervention that is likely to come, in Leopold's opinion. Why is this? Because of the many military applications of AI. It's no secret that military organizations are funding and carrying out themselves a lot of AI research. In fact, Jeffrey Hinton warned about this when he first came out and spoke about the potential dangers of AI. Historically, especially in the US, military funding has been used as an umbrella for basically all kinds of research. I think it can be hard to get basic science funding packages through Congress, but increases in military spending just kind of fly through. That's my theory anyways. So most computer science research, at least in the US, has one or more military-backed partners, which means that this research can relatively easily transform into real-world military applications. And I personally am starting to see signs of this, at least when it comes to open AI. Why is this bad, you might ask, especially if you live in the United States? Well, basically, autonomous weapons can be more accurate and more deadly. And best of all, humans from your side don't die when they're deployed. Sounds great if you're a government that wants to use weapons here and there without attracting a lot of criticism. However, giving autonomy to a robot with tons of weapons inside it has a lot of bad potential consequences. I don't really feel like I need to spell this out given the amount of sci-fi movies out there. So why are we seeing signs of this with OpenAI? Very overt signs, in fact, because OpenAI's board invited Paul Nakasone to join. Now, Paul Nakasone has been the director of the NSA, for a number of years. So if you had to pick one person to represent the entire security state, he would basically be it. Ostensibly, the reason that the former NSA director is joining the OpenAI board is so that OpenAI can better defend against attacks. The subtext being attacks from other nation states like China. But if you actually want to better defend against attacks, you don't want the leader of the NSA. You want the people that can get their hands dirty and really actually defend the systems and people that you have in place. For example, OpenAI used to be advertising for state-level security positions called National Security Threat Researcher, which I applied for but apparently didn't quite fit the bill. And in my opinion, that would be a more concrete step to actually defending your systems from outside attackers. So why is Nakasone joining the board? Well, it could be to signal to the intelligence community that OpenAI is open to collaborations with them. But more importantly, it's also easier for the US government to actually go to OpenAI and figure out what's happening or enforce certain directives if they can just go straight to the board and make it happen. And by the way, this former director of the NSA just retired in February three months ago. My guess is that he had this position with the OpenAI board lined up for quite some time. It's not unreasonable for him to say, hey, I want three months off between my old position and my new one when he's at that level of seniority. So this could indicate a sort of ongoing relationship or one that's been around for at least a couple of months. Part two, the San Francisco project. 
In his essay, Leopold talks about the project, which is his term for when the U.S. government starts to get involved in nationalizing the AI research effort for the good of the U.S. I made up the name the San Francisco Project because Leopold goes on and on about San Francisco in his introduction. And of course, because it's a play on the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project, of course, was a huge nationwide effort to research atomic bombs during World War II. Basically, the initial experiments in splitting atoms happened in Columbia University in New York City. So the military code name for the project became the Manhattan Project, even though the majority of the research was done out in the West and Los Alamos and places like that. So the San Francisco Project, how will this happen? Well, Leopold's argument is that the closer everybody gets to making AGI, the more obvious its military impacts will be. And while it seems sort of theoretical right now, and no one's really certain if we're going to make it there, once it becomes more concrete, and everybody in the field starts saying, yeah, AGI is right around the corner, then the US government will have to take notice. They'll consider it a national security imperative. So the government might even try to nationalize and combine all the AI research labs in the United States. And with the US government taking this action, other countries around the world will be forced to follow. There'd be an all-out race with China and other countries. The model weights and especially the algorithms used to train pre-AGI models will become the world's most valuable secrets. Nation-state espionage will escalate dramatically to try to get a handle on the secrets from other countries. So all these countries will be racing as fast as possible to develop AGI and from there to develop super intelligence, which according to many estimates would be a pretty fast follow on once you have AGI. And in theory, the first group to actually reach AGI or especially super intelligence would achieve a decisive military advantage, even if they're only in the lead by a couple of months compared to their geopolitical competitors. But we know that super intelligence could be really dangerous and throwing caution to the winds like this and accelerating through and developing the new technology as quickly as possible will make it much more likely that we'll destroy ourselves along the way. But more on that in the next section. Of course, the biggest rivalry as far as AI is concerned is the one between the United States and China. Leopold's essay highlights the Chinese Communist Party a lot. He doesn't think very positively of them, let's say. China is investing a lot into AI right now. In fact, sometimes China will have three or four times the number of papers at a conference compared to the United States. But the US labs have a decent lead in terms of research capability. They have the capital, they have the talent, and more importantly, the momentum to be developing products like ChatGPT and Claude and so on. So of course, China will hack all of these US-based entities. China has done this in the past when they hacked into about 35 organizations in 2010, including Google. This actually led to Google pulling out of the Chinese market, which at the time was a big economic disadvantage for China. So we could be looking at the birth of a potential new Cold War between the US and China based on AI capabilities. If you're not familiar with some of the capabilities of intelligence agencies, then you should know that they're extremely powerful. In addition to having essentially unlimited money and resources, they can also threaten people with imprisonment or gag orders and even threaten to cancel their citizenship. Just ask Edward Snowden, who tried to escape the United States after getting a bunch of pretty secret information from the NSA and sharing it with the world. He's probably the world's most famous whistleblower at this point. Anyway, he was flying through Hong Kong on his way to Ecuador, where he had asylum, but when he was in Hong Kong, US officials actually canceled his passport. So he was forced to stay in Russia, where he remains to this day. And as you can imagine, Edward Snowden is absolutely thrilled about Paul Nakasone joining the OpenAI board. Yeah, I think he called it a crime against every human or something like that. Anyways, state-sponsored actors can, for example, steal information just from the electromagnetic emanations from your computer or the vibrations and the sounds from your computer keyboard or zero click hack any iPhone if you just know the phone number of that iPhone or infiltrate an air gapped atomic weapons program. Yeah, you can look up Stuxnet if you're curious about that one. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that companies in general don't have the resources to defend against state-sponsored attackers. The bar for most companies is to defend against other corporate espionage. And as soon as state-sponsored actors come into play, they're not really that confident in their security. And startups, unfortunately, are the worst in terms of types of companies because they are budget constrained and they're moving very quickly. So security concerns generally get put under the heading of, we'll deal with that later. 
According to Leopold's essay, the internal security at OpenAI, for example, in terms of access to code repositories, is atrocious. But like I said, that's only to be expected and is probably true of every AI lab out there that's working on frontier models. So basically, it's a really volatile situation because it would be an absolute cakewalk for the Chinese government or any government for that matter, to infiltrate OpenAI and learn all of its current secrets. In fact, they're probably already doing so, at least if they believe that the danger from advanced AI is real and present. But rumors are there that they're not totally convinced on that yet. So good news, I guess? Part three, the doomsday argument. So why is this actually a bad idea? The Manhattan Project worked out great. Why shouldn't we have a San Francisco project that tries to create AGI faster than everyone else in the world? At a high level, my biggest concern with it is that there are other possible shapes to the future. As commenters on the EA forum pointed out, Leopold's worst case scenario and his best case scenario are actually very, very similar to each other. Worst case scenario is everyone running around really quickly and developing AGI. And best case scenario is same thing, except the United States has a slight lead. So the problem is that if this essay is the first introduction to the idea of AI safety, for a lot of people in the United States government, then it probably increases X risk by essentially putting them on a wartime footing when that doesn't need to be the case yet. Interestingly though, this essay by Leopold doesn't really seem to have gotten a lot of attention yet, possibly because it's so long. And who knows, maybe it'll stay that way, or maybe it will end up being widely read. I do think it's quite interesting, by the way. You can pick the section that interests you the most, there's like five or six sections, and check it out. Know that there's bias in there, of course, but there's pretty solid reasoning as well, so it's a useful data point to consider. At a practical level, my problem with this plan is that it just ends at the point where you develop superintelligence. What exactly is the plan once superintelligence exists, even if the US or your closest aligned AI power develops super intelligence first, what do we want to have happen? First problem is, how do you prevent other countries from copying the same achievement? Or worse, independent criminal actors, because AI technology will continue advancing, will continue getting more and more resources for cheaper. So the set of people that could potentially create super intelligence, not exactly in their basement, but with the resources available to them, would grow dramatically. In the AI literature, they talk about a strong act, like burning all GPUs, which is Eliezer Yudkowsky's example. The idea is that the first super intelligence to arise would want to embark on a strong act, some pretty severe action that would make sure that no other super intelligences could arise. Because as far as the super intelligence is concerned, it has no control over any new super intelligences that might arise. They could be rivals, they could set out to destroy the original, they could act counter to its own goals. So it might want to perform one of these strong acts. Let's take a step back for a moment and talk about marbles. Nick Bostrom came up with this marbles analogy. There's an urn in front of you, with a bunch of marbles inside it. Some of them are white, a few are red, and there are a tiny handful of black marbles inside the urn. Every time humanity invents something, it's like we reach into the urn and we take out a marble. If it's white, then the invention is neutral or helpful. If it's red, they're a lot more harmful, like weapons of mass destruction, but they don't directly cause extinction. But if the marble is black, then that means that that technology is what ends up destroying us. The Wait But Why blog gives the following example. If nuclear weapons were easy to make instead of extremely complex, then probably terrorists would have made nukes really frequently by now, and we might already be extinct. So nuclear weapons were almost a black marble, but fortunately, it turned out to be just red. But Nick Bostrom believes that super intelligence is our best black marble candidate yet. So why exactly would our best case scenario involve reaching into the urn and pulling out a marble that we suspect might be black? It just doesn't make sense. Above all, we can't know what a super intelligence would do to look after its own interests. Even if it was fully under the control of a group of humans, like the US government, and carrying out whatever tasks they wished, we know it's very likely that it would not stay that way. There is no box for AGI, and there's definitely no box for super intelligence. I'll make another video about that at some point, but for now, just trust me on this. So the claim from Wait But Why and from Nick Bostrom is that super intelligence is likely to eventually lead either to our extinction or to immortality. That's right, immortality, as in humans don't die anymore. It's such a powerful technology that the most extreme outcomes actually look the most plausible. 
However, we know from AI experts that the AI alignment problem is not at all solved. So we can't predict what an AI system is going to do, and we can't ensure that it's aligned with our goals. So I think that the path outlined in Leopold's essay on situational awareness is actually collective suicide. If you don't have governments coordinating with each other, agreeing on some basics on how to develop AI, then they will race because they'll look out for their own interests. And when they think about their own interests, military uses pop right up, which means that they really have to get on that and put as many resources behind it as possible. And if they race and we have no idea how to align those super intelligences, then it's really likely that we'll err on the side of extinction, unfortunately. So what should we do? Unfortunately, I don't have the answers, but the more humanity can act in unison, the better. We would ideally want a world government, or at least a strong coalition between all the nations engaged in AI research. That way, for example, strong restrictions on access to compute at scale could actually be enforced, which dramatically reduces the chances of rogue actors like criminal organizations getting their hands on an AGI system. It would be ideal if sufficient resources could be allocated to alignment research before taking any big steps. Right now, for example, red teaming a model, in other words, trying to get it to exhibit bad behaviors is a manual process and involves humans. If we could get models at scale that actually red team other models, or better yet, have some kinds of theoretical guarantees about the model's behavior, which is what Joshua Benio is researching, for example, then that would be really ideal. Certainly more ideal than a Darwinian race off a cliff. And yes, if lemmings came to mind just then, they did for me too. And you always think, why are the lemmings being so dumb and running off the cliff? Because going forward is progress. So going forward faster is better progress, right? Finally, in conclusion, we talked a lot about Leopold Aschenbrenner's new essay, Situational Awareness, and in particular about its predictions that there would be a project, a rapid militarization by governments of AI research labs. And unfortunately, the first step of that came into the public eye when the former NSA director was appointed to OpenAI's board. I talked about the San Francisco project, which is basically the Manhattan Project, but to invent AGI in a military fashion for the United States, and how if that starts happening, rivals like China are going to be very interested in learning what's going on behind the curtain. But right now, AI lab security is basically startup security, i.e. non-existent. So that's a really big problem that Leopold is also pointing out. But the problem that I would like to point out is that this is basically a doomsday prediction. If the worst that can happen is all the countries are racing for AGI and someone with bad intentions gets their hand on it, and yet the best that can happen is exactly the same thing, except the US government is slightly ahead of the other competitors, then that's really bad because we have not solved alignment not even remotely. So when super intelligence gets created, the chances that we're able to control it, the chances that it has a good objective, the chances that it will actually cooperate with its makers go way, way down. And we're on the path to extinction rather than the path to immortality. So please everyone, let's just consider not racing. I know it's really cool to be the first one across the finish line, but if you don't check for landmines first, that can end badly, right? If you want to go more deeply into these topics, I suggest three reading resources. You can check out Situational Awareness in the links below, and also check out the Wait But Why article in the links below as well, which is a really fantastic take on what would happen if we got superintelligence. And finally, there's also the book Superintelligence by Nick Bostrom, if you want to go into the weeds. If you liked this video, check out this previous one I made about how we could control superintelligence. Spoiler alert, we basically can't, but it's a fascinating topic. And if you want a chance to talk to me directly and other members of our community, then make sure to join our Discord. Well, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.